I'm Fran Scott, engineering presenter, and today we're going to do something that I never thought would be possible. Today we're going to go on a tour of the Great Exhibition of 1851. Now, this is all possible thanks to the Royal Parks because they've commissioned a virtual tour of the Crystal Palace, so the home of the Great Exhibition. And our tour guide today is Angela Kenny, and she's an archivist at the Royal Commission for the Exhibition of 1851, who were heavily involved in this project. So hello, Angela. Hello, Fran. I am so <laughs> excited about this tour. I just never thought I would be able to get to see the Crystal Palace. So thank you so much for being our tour guide today. A pleasure. Um, now, I'm going to ask you so, so many questions, but I just want to dive straight in, if that's OK. So um, what are we looking at at the moment? Well, at the moment, we're looking across the Serpentine in Hyde Park, um, which was the site of the Great Exhibition. And across here at the far side, you can see we can see the Crystal Palace. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Can we, can we get a closer look? We can. Let's go around. Let's go and stand at the front of the Crystal Palace, shall we, and have a look at it. Why not? Oh, my word. Here we are. This, this literally sends shivers down my spine because I just... Uh, it's such an iconic building and such an iconic representation of what happened after like it's and to like we're, we're stood here we're, look, we're looking at the crystal palace we are and in this virtual one you get a real idea of the size of it so yeah it's huge, huge. absolutely <laughs> huge it's beautiful <laughs> and how many stories so we've got the four is that that's that's the, obviously the, the classic curved roof there and that's sort of what the crystal palace has become known for amongst obviously all the culture that was inside it yes it has become known for that but in actual fact the first design that was done didn't have that on it um it was designed by joseph paxton uh -huh. and he designed it with a flat, a flat roof and it was only later because there were objections to chopping down the trees that would have been inside the crystal palace that the design was modified to have that arched roof so that the trees could be maintained. Hold the phone. So, You're saying that there are trees inside the Crystal Palace. There are, we'll, we'll see them when we go inside, Fran. <laughs> Let's yes, go inside. There are trees inside there. I've been waiting for this. So here we are. We've Whoa. come inside the Crystal Palace. And here's one of the, the trees. <laughs> <laughs> so you literally... Just in front of us. Yeah, you, you met with that as you as you enter. Now, obviously, it's it's... Oh, it, it does blow me away to actually be able to go into the Crystal Palace. Um, there aren't any exhibits here at the moment, are there? There are the, yes, there there aren't any exhibits. There are very few. We've got um, a fountain in the middle, which we'll see later, but the other exhibits aren't in yet. But as you said earlier, this has been commissioned by the Royal Parks. But my understanding is that the next phase of what they want to do is to populate it with exhibits so what would this have been like in 1851 well there would have been lots of statues that we would have seen in this section of the crystal palace right and i'm going to turn round so that we can look down here we can see a fountain yeah this is osler's crystal fountain and that was in the middle um right in the center of the crystal palace where the transept and the nave intersected right so this would have been a major focus for people coming into the crystal palace i've seen pictures of this fountain and um but to so i suppose now i was gonna say but to see it in real life uh, <laughs> but to actually see it in situ and in 3d it it's amazing yes yes and we've got a photograph actually of almost this exact shot if you have a look um Oh, the photograph uh -huh. of the Osler's fountain, you can see the tree in the background. And then behind us are some gates and they're the Colebrookdale gates. Right. They were, they were made in Colebrookdale. They were big iron gates and they are still in Hyde Park, though they have, they have been out of Hyde Park and been brought back in. But they're fairly close to the Albert Memorial in Hyde Park now, so they can still be seen. Yes. Are those, are those the gates that you enter as you come up Exhibition Road? And yes. then there's some gates and then, oh gosh, so those yes. gates were actually in the Crystal Palace. They were. They were inside the Crystal Palace. Yes. That's great. That is. Oh, Angela. Yeah, I love, I love your knowledge. <laughs> Where should we go next? 
Uh, Gosh, that view, that view down it is spectacular, isn't it? It is, it is. And it just gives you an idea of the the whole length of the Crystal Palace. It was um, 1,848 feet long. So (laughs) that was, yes, huge, huge. And especially for people travelling from in all over the UK and all over the world to come and visit it. It must have been absolutely astonishing to see. It's phenomenal. And even just looking at the glass now and the roof on the glass, like they are big pieces. They're big pieces. And you perhaps don't get um, a proper idea looking down here, but they're all built with furrows. So the drainage, the water could run off down the furrows into gutters. Uh, there were 21 miles of gutters <laughs> and... The rainwater could go down there, down the inside of the columns that are inside the Crystal Palace, and then out. Clever. So it was, uh, yes, very clever, very clever. Internal drainage, because yes. this is England. Yeah. Yes, that's right. It just blows my mind, like that view down from the fountain, and you can just imagine and hear like the hustle and bustle, and it being because this wouldn't have been a quiet place, you know. You've it's no. the age of steam. Like, it's it's yes. not going to be like your Hush museums that you have today. This would have been loud, right? Yes, it would have been very loud. There'd be lots and lots of people for a start, but there was also lots of machinery. So perhaps that's a good place to go. We could go across to this corner of the um, Crystal Palace. Oh. Yeah, so here we are in the West End. The doors that we can see across, t- across here are the west right. doors and there's an ent- entrance there for people to come in and in this far corner across here there was the machinery section so there would be huge uh, machines we've got a picture of some of the machines in motion oh, 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 oh. they're not small beasts are they they're not small beasts and just outside that corner of the crystal palace was an engine room um where, where steam was made so that that could then be brought into the building to be used to power those machines. Of course, yeah, because you, yeah, you, you can't have machines without steam in those days. No, that's right, that's right. And so that would have been very, very noisy um, in that corner. That's weird because the photo looks like it's it's not on the ground floor. Like, it, it, it looks like it's got a low roof. Yes, it, it has got a low roof, but it is on the ground floor. It's just that that section of the Crystal Palace um, is lower um, than the rest, but it, it was on the ground floor. Because it, it makes total sense guess, to put those machines on the ground floor. Yes. I think the size of the machines, you would not have got them up this uh, staircase here to go to the galleries. So. That's, the floor loading may well not have coped with that, I think. So. And in front of the... Um, machinery section then there would have been a a refreshment court so there were three refreshment courts in the great exhibition in the crystal palace there was um this one which is the west Mm -hmm. one there was one in the central transept which was the central one and one in the um, east end which was the eastern refreshment court and they were all run by schweppes so this was quite a big day out for people wasn't it and when you're talking about refreshments and the first thing that comes to my mind is toilets right um and correct me if i'm wrong but was the crystal palace the was it the first time flushing public toilets were used that that is right is it? yes yes uh, there were flushing public toilets um which people used and 827,820 people used the flushing <laughs> toilets in the course of the great exhibition the Victorians really did keep records of absolutely <laughs> <Didn't> <laughs> Oh my word, so this would have been phenomenal, like to like this was the first time the public could use a flushing toilet, you know, the as a obviously the great and the good would have them, but like your average Joe wouldn't yeah. so like on a Yes, for a for in a public yeah. place. And at the end of the exhibition, the commission wrote a report about the exhibition and things that we'd learnt from it. And one of the things that was mentioned when they were discussing the toilets was that there should be more ladies' toilets in public places because the demand had been so high in the Crystal Palace that they realised that there was obviously a demand elsewhere that needed to be met. Well, you know, if only people listen. 
<laughs> That's right. So, Angela, I've read a little bit about the, the different types of tickets of the Great Exhibition, which really intrigues me because obviously this was at a time that there was massive class divide. And so... Mm. At first thought, I thought, oh, it was only for the upper classes, but that's not particularly correct, is it? No, it isn't. People came from all over the country and just normal working class people came from all over the country to visit the Great Exhibition. Um, Thomas Cook uh, really got underway with organising <laughs> excursions down from the north to the Great Exhibition. And it was seen as something that lots of people did. Um, so there were about six million visitors came to the Great Exhibition. Hold the uh, phone. Si- yeah, si- six million over five months? Over, yes, yes. So that was a huge number. That was about a third of the UK prop- population at the time. Gosh. Um, though not all of those, there would have been a lot of foreign visitors as well, of course. Yes, yeah, of course. But um, yes, excursion trains were organised from various cities down to London for people to come over that visit the Great Exhibition. And then where should we go next? Shall we have a look at the elephants? And yes, the house yes. Start with? <laughs> Anyone that says, should we have a look at the elephants? My answer is yes. <laughs> so as we first came into the um, exhibition through the door we came in, the south door, yeah. on the left-hand side, we would have had um, the India exhibits. And we've got a f- picture of part of one of those. This is uh, from Dickinson's prints of the exhibition uh-huh. and you'll see that there are two howders the seats that go on the back of elephants i'm glad you explained what they were thank you <laughs> yeah. they have been brought over from india uh, right. for the exhibition but um they wanted to have an elephant to actually put them on so that they could be shown and after a hunt round by the commissioners they came across an elephant in saffron walden museum uh, right. unfortunately it's an african elephant but uh it still went ahead, and so the elephant was brought down from Saffron Waldron, and this was the only stuffed elephant in the country. So there it is with a, one of the howders on its back. It really gives you a feel of what it was like, you know, because th- these do look like the great and the good, don't they? And you can see them looking over and down, and just... it. If I'm intrigued by what's going on here in 2020, then I can't imagine what they would have thought in 1851. Yes, yes. And it really was as if the whole world had come to Hyde Park. Um, Angela, can you take us to where you, to where we would have, you know, so where that picture is? Yeah, so if we go back onto the map, and as we came in... Let's turn round, so we've got our back to... There's the door that that we came in originally. And the elephants were down this side here. Gosh, yeah. So that's the gallery so that we be... can see in the in the watercolour. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And... Yes, the, the gallery up here, the one that we're looking at, I think, in the watercolour. Brilliant. And those galleries, um, are there are there enclosed parts on the other stories as well, or just like the galleried walkways? Shall we go up and have a look? Yes, please. See. Can we can we go up? I didn't realise we could go up. Here we are. <gasps> so I think we're upstairs now. So here's the galleried walkway, but there were displays up here as well. Ah, oh, brilliant. And what can we see just there looking across? Is that another story? There, were, there wasn't another story. Um, it's just two stories. So that's just the across here, you mean? Yes, and across yeah. there, that's just part of the building. It wasn't another story, so it was just two stories. There was the ground floor, and there were the galleries. Get you, get you. And the and the galleries are open. The galleries are open. Yes. Fair enough. Ah, yes. Oh, yes. Then you can see the. I see it. There's the staircase going down onto the ground floor. Yeah. And right across here, so we're looking across to the far um, to the sort of northeast end. There was the stained glass gallery which we've got a picture of. And again, this is one of the Dickinson's prints um, taken from a watercolour. Oh, <gasps> it looks so good. <laughs> so you can see they've actually blacked out with curtains 
the surrounding area so that they can get the full effect of the light coming through the um, stained glass. Yeah, and you can the like just you you heard my reaction to that picture. It's yeah, it's well, you can really just imagine being there, and also it just made it. What they seem to have done is really show the exhibit to their best effect. Yes, yes, yes. And I think to get the yeah, to get the light coming through, I mean, stained glass wouldn't have looked anywhere near as good if they hadn't got the light coming through and blacked out the rest. So it would really have shown it off. Exactly. Um, and in a place that's made of glass, <laughs> you could get yes. a fair bit of light. Yes, you would get a lot of light, a lot of light. So can we look over and look down onto the ground floor? Oh, there. So you really do get a good idea of the whole length of the building when you're standing up here. And I guess even the people in 1851 would have, because from up here, they would have been able to see a long, long way across the Crystal Palace. And it makes you realise why they've done that gallery, because, yeah, there was exhibits up there, but it would give you a whole new way to be able to see the exhibits that were on the ground floor. Yes. Yes, you get a better view looking down into the exhibits from above, um, but they really did need that space as well because they had over 100,000 exhibits. <laughs> so to fit, to fit them in, they really did need that extra um, ex exhibition space upstairs. Was it, was it always designed with the gallery or was that like, uh, we need more space, let's add the gallery in? Yes, originally it wasn't designed with the gallery, but it, quite early on it became obvious that they, they needed to add the gallery. But certainly in the Commission's archives, we've got the costings out for how much more is it going to cost to build if we add in the extra gallery. Fair enough, fair enough, because this was a remarkably cheap building for what it was as well. It was, yes, yes. And I guess because it was built in sections and wasn't somebody laying lots and lots of bricks or stones, then it, it was cheaper and it could be erected a lot quicker. And they started to build it in September 1850 and it was largely finished by January 1851 and the exhibition opened in 1st of May 1851. So, Angela, can you take us to another of your favourite places, please? Yes. Let's go back onto the map. I'll just never get bored of looking at this place. Yeah. It's... I, think, I think we'll perhaps pop outside to look at the West End. OK. So here we are. At the West End. Hello, the... Crystal Palace. Crystal Whoa. Palace. And you'll see at this end, we've got this fence going round yeah. the outside. This is showing some of the exhibits that were too big to have inside. <laughs> so we've got a picture of those as well, Fran. Again, one of the Dickinson prints. It's like the, they look like obelisks or something? That's right, yes. Yeah, so this is the exterior at the West End, and this was where they housed and displayed big uh, lumps of coal, uh, marble columns, so big things from the raw materials section. Ah. Um, big slabs of granite that couldn't fit into the inside the Crystal Palace very easily. I like and that. So was they that, were that, housed outside. Is that what the section was called? Big things from the raw materials section. <laughs> <laughs> it says what it is, doesn't it? it? It does say what it is. And actually in the background of this picture, uh -huh. you can see a little chimney with smoke coming out. Yeah. And that that is the engine house. You remember when we were looking at the moving machinery, I yeah. said that there was an engine house outside. Well, that is the engine house that was generating the steam. Brilliant, brilliant. And yeah. could you take me to another place? Let's go back onto the map and see what we've got down there. Let's go back down into the centre. Yes, yeah, so here we are. I think this is my favourite view and probably the most iconic view of the inside is looking down the transept and seeing the uh, tree at the end. So we have got a, one of the Dickinson prints yeah. showing this, Let me uh, get... which has got Osser's fountain in the foreground and then you can see the tree, which looks virtually identical to the one on the... Um, on the virtual reality Crystal Palace uh, in the background. This is literally blowing my mind to see 
that print and this virtual reality together. We are virtually aren't looking at the same picture on screen in the virtual Crystal Palace as we are from the Dickinson print. And even though it's on screen, it because of the way that it's been produced, it does feel like you're touring around it. I suppose it's because we're used to like Google Maps and stuff these days that this yes. doesn't feel like it's not there anymore. Yes, yes. And you've got, you can, well, you see the people who are wandering around the Great Exhibition, but also you get all the colours of the ends of the galleries and the downpipes across here. You can see there's lots of red and gold and blue it really was very bright and vibrant um in the decorations it's as well as all the bright decorate uh, bright exhibits that were inside of course of course like this is i can just look at this like i'm done <laughs> we can just <laughs> and there would have been lots of banners hanging down from these from the ends of the balconies so the different countries who were exhibiting would have their flags hanging down here saying what country it was that was exhibiting Makes or what sense. area of the UK was exhibiting. And exhibits came from all over the world, didn't they? Yes, they did, yes. Uh, China, um, Germany, which wasn't Germany at the time, but um, <laughs> the German states, uh, France sent a lot, the United States of America sent a lot of exhibits, um, the Balt countries of, on the Baltic sent exhibits, and they were actually delayed in coming because the Baltic Sea froze over that winter, and so there was uh, some delay in those ex exhibits arriving, but, but they were allowed in. So how long was the planning for this? Because it was built quite quickly, and yet exhibits came from all over the world, but back then it wasn't like you could just shove something on a plane and get it here. So, like, it must have been a logistical nightmare, and the fact that it... It opened on time, on budget, with all of the exhibits? Yes, yes. That's incredible, isn't it? Yes. So although the exhibits were temporary and the whole Crystal Palace was temporary, and yes, yes it moved down to South London, the legacy yes. that the Crystal Palace left behind is, is basically all around that area still, isn't it? It's all around that area and it goes on to that this day. Um, the exhibition made £186,000, which was a lot of money at the time. And considering that when the first idea of doing an exhibition was uh, mooted, it was thought that they wouldn't make any money. It was how will we afford to do it? But in actual fact, it was very, very successful, um, largely driven by Prince Albert himself, who um, organised the committees and um, was the president of the... Royal Commission for the Exhibition of 1851, um, so was really responsible and was very, very hands-on in organising the exhibition. Um, so yes, it was very successful. It made £186,000. And so at that stage, when it became obvious, which was probably about August 1851, it was becoming obvious that it was going to make a lot of money, uh, Prince Albert started to think about what would happen with that to that money at the end of the exhibition. And the first thing that Prince Albert did to try and dispose of the income was to purchase a large estate in South Kensington, just across the road from where the Crystal Palace was. So the commission bought eight to seven acres of land um, opposite the Crystal Palace, where uh, Exhibition Road is now, yeah. where the Royal Albert Hall is and Imperial College the Royal College of Art, the Royal College of Music, and the big national museums, the Science Museum, the V&A, and the Natural History Museum. And so the commission was instrumental in getting those organisations up and running and moved on to that estate. We've got a plan, actually, of Ooh. showing um, the lands that the commission bought. And you'll see at the time, it's, a lot of it is green. It was orchards and market gardens, um, a few big houses along the main roads. Uh -huh. But it was really thought to be a bit of a, a back of the beyond, really. <laughs> um, and because of that, the land was quite cheap when the Commission bought it, so we managed to get quite a large estate. For a good deal. 
for a good deal, yes. Because some people might think it's just chance that you've got the V&A, the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum all together, but that was the plan. Like, not necessarily from the start of the Great Exhibition, but when that profit started rolling in, that was, and they bought the land, they were like, let's see what we can create legacy-wise. Yes, Prince Albert wanted it to be um, an estate where there would be education and learning and discussion and displays and so yes that really is what there is there now and it was in his original design for the estate. Angela this <laughs> is fantastic and um, what I wouldn't mind doing is going outside of the Crystal Palace I can't believe I'm saying that going outside the Crystal Palace um, and <laughs> to just sort of see where it is in Hyde Park because what I'd love to do is to right. be able to go to Hyde Park and sort of, it sounds a bit geeky, but stand where the Crystal Palace was. Like, because that's the, yeah. can I see on the left there, is that the track for the, 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 the horses track? That's right, yes. And from here, we've got the Crystal Palace on our right, and we're looking down towards the Albert Memorial right, yeah. and the Colbrookdale Gate that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So you can actually see the site of the Crystal Palace. A few years ago, the Royal Parks marked it out <gasps> on the ground. Until then, there was nothing to be seen of the Crystal Palace. But they carried out a project to mark out the footprint of the Crystal Palace. So you can stand um, by this door uh-huh and you can go there and, and it's can... and it's on the floor like there is a mark it's on it's on the floor by this door there's a raised plaque so you can oh. look at that and then there is a footprint marked out and on the corners of each uh, on each corner of the crystal palace there's a plaque to mark the edges of the corners brilliant um i know what i'm doing <laughs> this weekend <laughs> Angela, you have been absolutely fantastic. I never thought I would get a tour around the Great Exhibition. Um, Neither did I. <laughs> <laughs> so th thank you so much. I've, I've loved it and I've loved comparing um, the virtual tour to the pictures as well. That's absolutely brilliant. And I must say a massive thank you to the Royal Commission for the Exhibition of 1851 and um, for providing access to those pictures. And also to the Royal Parks because they're the ones that have actually created this virtual tour. Now, if you guys want to go on your own virtual tour, this is available for free for everyone to look at. And all you've got to do is just go to the Royal Parks website, which is Royal Parks parks.org.uk and also follow the royal parks on all the social media channels and um, but angela thank you so much and thank you guys for watching